My name is Sidney Romine. I am on a boat. The boat is cruising slowly in the mid-afternoon sunlight, showing the 200 or so people on board the quaint sights of Ellicott Bay and, in the far distance now, the Seattle waterfront. I have a light beer in my right hand, and I'm sitting below deck, enclosed and out of the sun. Everyone, the tourists, the locals on board, seem to be enjoying themselves. But I just saw something out the window to my left that has made me worry. I'm afraid. There's something out there on the water, something others have already seen but aren't concerned about in the slightest. It's just me, I'm sure. But I've been conditioned by the past. I seem to have developed a sense of imminent catastrophe. I've never felt quite like this before. And I think to myself now, as I sit here, not knowing what to do, that of course I should have known better than to get on a boat. I should have suspected that the end of my life would take place on a mechanism of transit, likely one I hadn't thought twice about. Even at the age of four, you see, mechanical things that moved at great speed played a big part in my fears and my fascinations. When I lay in my bed at night in the big house I used to live in with my mom and dad, and I looked across the dark bedroom at my closet, it was not a ghost or a monster I feared behind its door. No. I never told my parents or anyone else about what I thought was lurking in there. It was a car, a black, small but lethal car, crouched in the shadows among my toys and games, inches below the reach of the hem of my winter coat. The car's cruel bulk took up every inch of space inside the closet. I believed it retreated inside the eaves of the house during the day, somehow expanding and contracting, driving around and around silently in an unseen rectangular tunnel. At night, the car would start again, and it would creep into my closet and wait, engine idling. If I were to open the closet then, its headlights would spring on. I would be blinded, and then I would be crushed as it roared forward, splintering the closet door, reducing it to shreds. The car haunted me all the way through second grade. I've never understood where my belief in it came from or where it eventually went. I tell you that story so I can tell you two more. Two things that happened to me later in life. Two events completely unrelated to each other, more than two decades apart. It makes sense to me now that because of phantom cars and childhood closets, and only four years later, a horror on a train in the middle of the night, I became, at age 27, an air traffic controller. Through talk therapy, I eventually came to see that my experience on the train and perhaps even with the car of my childhood nightmares, had altered my mind deeply. They had made me subconsciously forge a lifelong connection to the structures and machinery of transit. In particular, its rigid order, its logical timetables, structure, and geometry. I wanted to immerse myself in that strict, linear world and cause it always to make perfect sense in direct reaction to being paralyzed by the mysteries of what I had experienced. I studied hard, trained my brain to master pattern recognition, perceptual awareness, critical thinking. 
I was good at what I did, I believe. And nothing bizarre or inexplicable ever happened during my career in ATC outside, say, a Learjet encountering almost fatal wind shear ten bare seconds before landing. Or, in one memorable instance, undetected clear ice breaking off the wing of a DC-10 and destroying an engine as the plane took off from Stapleton Airport, causing a near crash that would have been partially my fault for communicating ineffectively about the ditch route that was available to the pilot should she need it. Her experience and alertness corrected my cognitive blip, and everything was all right. I punished myself for weeks over that one, but eventually felt fine again, enjoying my job and its relative predictability. I went home after every shift feeling like there was order in the world, and I was part of maintaining that order. Life was fine until Canal Airlines Flight 111 on July 21st, 2013. It was a routine passenger jet trip from Houston Hobby Airport to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, leaving at 8.15 a.m. Central Time with 121 souls on board. The cockpit crew were Captain Daniel Hengist, age 44, and co-pilot Ronald Carmen, age 33. I first made contact with the plane from Kansas City Air Route Traffic Control Center at 9.41 a.m. Central Time, when it entered Missouri airspace in bright morning sunlight. We shared the usual cruising altitude communications until we didn't. Canal 111, Canal 111 Heavy, left 340. Canal 111, turn left, heading 040. Want to keep you away from traffic. We'll straighten you out shortly. Roger, 111 Heavy, uh, left heading 040. Uh, can you tell me how far away that traffic is? 111, approximately 6 miles, heading due east. Roger. Canal 111 Heavy, I need a check on the weather at our current location. We're seeing we're seeing a lot of uh, disturbance up ahead. Canal 111 now winds 230 degrees, 5 knots, cloud base 630 meters, and this is going to be 6,000 no shear. 111, uh, confirmed by match. Any reports of anything different? We have, uh, we have different visuals. We have uh, heavy uh, approaching darkness all around, increasing darkness. 111, no, uh, no reports from aircraft to hit two landings in Joplin. Not reported any problems. Thank you. We're not showing anything either on avionics, but um, uh, visibility. Visibility has gone near dark in every direction. From We've gone from clear to uh, minimal visibility. 111, do you want to descend? Do you want to block? Can you give me a block between 20 and 25 so I can take a different look? Descent to block altitude flight level 200 through flight level 250. Yep, we'll take that block. Uh, we'll report back in about five minutes. Roger, right 11. Canal 111, we have complete darkness all around the aircraft. No visual with the ground or sky. Uh, can you get me out of here? Okay, uh, 111, you should have Whiteman AFB down below in about two minutes, and then Skyhaven off to your left. No, 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 we, we have, uh, we're on a total blackout up here. The, no cloud cover, we're in nothing that registers, total blackness. Canal 111 is the co-pilot in the cockpit. 111 Heavy, the co-pilot's in the cabin. Uh, uh, flight attendants aren't reporting. One or two unsettled passengers back there, the aircraft's mine. Maintaining flight level 200. All right, sir, I don't want to take you down any further, but let's turn left heading 060. Let's give you a little bit of a can. Roger, turning left heading uh, 060 again. Uh, we are in total darkness, complete IFR. Uh, I have no idea what the uh, weather cell this is. Can you give me another look at the weather? 111 on the ATS, wind 
210 degrees, 5 knots, cloud base, 530 meters, visibility 6,000, no shear. I want to have a heavy, uh, okay, I'm going to need a, some kind of other look from some other source, because we are in some kind of system, like sunspot, something that's just getting darker. Roger, I have a confirmation of no systems from MCI Tower, but I'll look around for you. Alaska 261, contact center on 126.52. Alaska 261, good day. 261, this is EKC requesting you make a visual on an Airbus A330 at 10 o'clock, about 4 miles, Canal 111. 261, we'll let you know when you get it. 261, experienced any heavy clouds or storm systems since uh, Waypoint Caper? Thank you. Okay, uh, he's, he's having some visual problems up there. If you can let me know, as far as we know, he doesn't have any intent of going below 20,000 feet. 261, we'll advise. When I was nine years old, my parents put me on a train, alone, to go visit my grandparents in Fargo. A 12-hour overnight trip, and terribly exciting to a boy that age. My first time on the rails. I was seated beside a young woman whose name I tried and tried to remember over the years, always unable. In her late twenties, she was returning east from Los Angeles. After two years of frustration trying to break into the film industry as an actress, she at first thought I was simply bored and needed some entertaining. So she offered to play Uno with me, and that led to her regaling me with the funny stories of her misadventures in Hollywood, the awful temp jobs, the degrading auditions, the occasional brushes with celebrities whose names I mostly didn't even recognize. I think now she simply misinterpreted my shyness for worry about being by myself on the train. But I didn't mind. She was a lot of fun. Yet even at nine, I could detect a real sadness in her. Because she didn't like what she was returning to at all. Was obviously feeling humiliated. Worried about money. Feeling like a failure. She had to get off in Montana, very close to Glacier National Park, in the middle of the night, at a small town called Marksburg. I didn't really know how the train schedule worked. I didn't know that no matter what the weather was like, all stops had to be made, and the passengers who were due to disembark had to. A snowstorm was tearing through the state at the time, and it felt like a miracle to me that we could keep going as the snow continued to pile up outside the windows. Hopped up on candy bars from the cafe car, I was still wide awake at half past two in the morning when the actress packed up her things and squeezed past me into the aisle. Come see me off, I remember her saying cheerfully, and I was happy to. We crept quietly through the dark between all the sleeping passengers and made our way to the lower level into a bleak, gray, somewhat chilly steel vestibule where a plump conductor was standing and preparing to open a door to let out anyone scheduled to get off at Marksburg. But this seemed to be just my new friend. She didn't have anyone coming to meet her for reasons she never said. Canal 111 Heavy, we are maintaining flight level 180, nothing visible in any direction. We are totally curtain in black, black all around. Roger, we can we get the co-pilot back? I'm not, I'm not getting any call back from the cabin, we'll move the form. Okay, let me know as soon as he's back up there. Can I get your fuel in gallons? Gallons of fuel, 2810. Roger, 111. Descent to flight level 140. Maintain airspeed. You're clear. Uh, let me know as soon as you see something. We've got, um, we, you've got Macon right below you. Beyond that, we're going to put you into a right-hand orbit. Vector you to the Kippen waypoint. 111 Heavy, descending to flight level 140. Canal 111, I've lost you on radar. 
I'm here, transponder functioning. I have no communication with the captain. This is Canal 111 Heavy. We've lost the passengers. 111, say again. Cabin pressure is steady. We've lost the passengers. There's no visual on any passengers. I have no FAs, no co pilot. 111, confirm that you're looking at the cabin directly. The cockpit door is open. Affirmative. I see no passengers. I have no comm with the FAs. There's no one back there. 111, confirm you're saying there are no passengers. Affirmative. My craft is not on your radar. Affirmative. You are not on radar. Has there been a cabin breach? Negative. No breach. Sir, what's your altitude? Holding at 140. Can you give me a pressurization reading? 5.9 PSI. I feel fine. No ECAM warnings. Engine parameters normal. 111, I can have you set down. Do you want to declare an emergency? Affirmative. I'm declaring an emergency. Where can you vector me? I can bring you into Shankfield or Council Bluffs, depending on traffic. You will be flying with only ILS, correct? Affirmative ILS. Uh, bring me into Shank. Jesus Christ, the passengers are gone. It's, all the seats are empty. Okay, 111, we're going to bring you down. We're going to get some visuals for you. Uh, instruct Shank Tower to light things up for you. Canal 111, turn left, heading 350 to intercept the localizer, maintain flight level 120, cleared ILS into runway 18R, contact tower at 11827. 111, turning left, heading 350, flight level one, uh, correction 120. Want to affirm that I have no passengers and no crew, no visuals outside the cockpit, no variants whatsoever. Uh, uh, no anomalous readings, I'm in complete darkness. Running lights are non functional. Running lights are non functional. Alaska 261, you back with me? Alaska 261, affirmative. We've not been able to make a visual. Can you tell me your weather up there? 261 weather is fine. We have sun, winds, 8 knots, ran the little CUT a few minutes ago. Okay, 261, he should be 2 miles away at 40 degrees. Let me know when you see him. ZKC, we have no aircraft. We have eyes in the cockpit, eyes in the cabin. We don't have anything. You want us to increase airspeed? Well, not safe. He's in and out of radar. I'm going to get back to you in a few. At about two and a half hours past midnight, in a brutally cold and windy January, the actress and I stood near a luggage rack in the steel vestibule on the bottom floor of the cross-country train, watching the landscape roll past the window. And I felt afraid. The snow was coming down hard, blowing sideways. And as the train entered Marksburg, the entire little town was utterly dark, everyone asleep or hidden away. The station itself was nothing more than a small, dimly lit square brick enclosure. It was unattended, and I barely saw it go past, so intense was the snowfall. As the engine quieted, I could hear the wind howling. The actress planned to call for a taxi from inside the building. She bundled up and prepared to get off. I was amazed that anyone would be so heartless as to let her off in conditions like this. She offered me a last smile, and the train car stopped a few hundred feet past the station, where the platform was not fully lit. Seeing how underdressed I was for the conditions, the conductor made sure with a smile that I wasn't planning on disembarking. I shrunk away from him. He lowered his head and opened the door. And though I was standing well behind the actress, the wind blew in and hit me hard. I know now that the temperature at that time of year in Montana can get down to 10 or even 20 below zero. I had never felt cold like that before and never have since. I couldn't see more than 20 feet through the dark and the driving snow. My friend, almost unrecognizable in a confused mass of hats, scarves, and gloves, 
turned and gave me a cheerful wave, and then stepped off, hoisting her stuffed backpack over her shoulder. She climbed carefully down the step stool the conductor had placed for her and began to walk down the platform, head down against the shameless wind, navigating with difficulty through about six inches of snow covering the cement. The conductor, shivering, pummeled by the snow, hopped back on board quickly and pulled the door shut fast, grimacing. He tipped his cap to me and mounted the stairs again to the upper level leaving me alone. I watched my friend out the window. Instead of walking all the way to the station, she seemed to catch sight of a cab in the parking lot behind it. I could just barely see its shape out there waiting. Only its running lights were on. She must have thought she'd gotten lucky. She went down three steps and began to cross an empty square patch about 30 yards long and 30 yards wide holding tight to a thin railing. She set foot on the ground, shuffling through the rising accumulation, arms wrapped tightly around her, the wind so high that her balance was unsteady. The train began to move out of the station. I would learn later that it was not usual procedure to have such a brief stop, but the engineer was likely worried about more and more snow building up on the tracks. I had lost almost all visual detail of what was going on out there. My friend was just a shape in the darkness now, obscured by the storm. I saw something happen to her then. From three different directions, her left and right side and directly before her, three separate and distinct forms emerged from somewhere within the blizzard. They loomed above her, not less than eight feet high, I believe. They had no human properties, these dark things without heads, without arms. I think she stopped where she was for just a brief second, in fright, before All three of the things almost simultaneously enfolded her by spreading out wide, wing-like masses from their sides, floating forward. And then the train was too far past this site for me to follow it any longer. Canal 111 contact 193.12. Canal 111 contact 193.12. 111 heavy up down. 111, we have no radar contact. Can you give me your position? Pitch black, I'm on the ground. There's nothing outside the cockpit. Can you exit the aircraft, sir? Have others exited the aircraft? There are no other souls on board. Confirm that you're on the ground and the engines are down. Jesus, there's, there's, there's children out there. There's children. They're coming. The, the, there are children coming toward the plane. They have fire. They're holding fire in their hands. Okay, let's get you out of the plane, so let's get you out of there. Have you been able to contact the cabin? I'm not going to move. They're going to hurt me. about your position you can tell me from your visual there's, a star- there's been a starboard rear door unlock sir are you with me they're aboard I can handle I can handle
There was no making sense of what I saw when my friend, the actress, vanished in the snow in Marksburg. I retreated to the safety of my seat upstairs, where no one could see me crying. I didn't know who to tell, who to turn to. So I did nothing. Somehow I knew she was gone, simply gone, stolen or devoured. I never slept that night, and when my grandparents met me at the station in Spokane the next morning, I became ill and had difficulty moving from bed for two days. Eventually, when I was 16, I think, I did tell someone what I had seen. They didn't believe me. At the age of 20, I took the train back through Marksburg on my way home for spring break. I got off at that lonely little station in bright noon sunlight and stood in the grassy spot where my friend had disappeared. Some months before, I'd finally found out her name from the archives of the Montana Standard. Sandy Magley, a woman of 28, had disappeared on her way home to her parents' house on Bolt Street, a mile and a half away. She'd never been found. There were no suspects in her disappearance. That is the story of my train trip. Three and a half years after the utter vanishing of Canal Airlines Flight 111, the National Transportation Safety Board was finally obliged to released to the public its findings about the nature and possible causes of the incident. Naturally, there were almost no conclusions that illuminated this now famous mystery. I printed out the full 616-page report and drove with it to my father's house in Olympia for Easter. I took the pages upstairs to my childhood bedroom after dinner and settled atop the bed for the evening with a cup of tea. How odd it was to read the report and see my words to the aircraft reproduced there in black and white, part of the incident forever. I was criticized in the report for failing to confirm with the captain the number of souls on board when he first declared an emergency, a standard query when there's the slightest possibility of a serious in-flight incident, in particular, a crash. As I read, my father, 84 that night, was downstairs reading a biography of Neville Chamberlain. Just before 11 p.m., I heard the squealing of tires outside in the street. The house was at the end of a cul-de-sac in a very quiet, middle-class neighborhood, and such a sound was cause for alarm. An engine revved, the sound getting closer. I got off my old bed and went to my window. I saw headlights about 200 yards away, approaching. The car seemed to be gaining speed, already traveling at perhaps 50 miles per hour on a road where the speed limit was 25. It was headed on a straight shot directly for the house. It was too late to do much of anything. I could only watch when the car made no sign whatsoever of braking, as it came to within 50 yards of our lawn, I yelled out for my father at the top of my lungs. The car jumped the curb and tore across the grass, bouncing chaotically, and then vanished below my sight line. I heard it crash through the plate glass window downstairs as it tore into the home I'd lived in until the age of 19. I ran frantically down the stairs, smelling gasoline. The car had smashed in, destroyed everything in the living room, and then crashed into the wall, separating it from the dining room. It had gone almost halfway through it before it had banked violently to the left and come to a halt, the front end demolished all the way up to the windshield. Glass, cement, and drywall were sprayed everywhere. The engine was still running, though no power was being applied to it. 
It was black, that car, almost rusted through around the wheel wells. A 1977 Volvo 242 without license plates. Still screaming for my father, I clambered atop the ruined, upturned sofa he'd spent so much time on in his later years and jumped down next to the driver's side door. I pulled on it hard. It could just barely open all the way without striking the carpet, so severe was the tilt at which the car had come to rest. There was a man in the driver's seat, a man only twelve years younger than my elderly father. Somehow, without wearing a seat belt, he had not only survived, but he seemed to be without a scratch. He turned his head to look at me. He had a strange, horrible smile on his face, as if he had a sly little secret to impart to me. I made it, he said. And then, eyes still open, his chest stopped rising and falling, and he simply stopped living. My father had died 15 seconds before, crushed under the car's repulsive weight. There would be no finding out why this madman had chosen our neighborhood to execute his insane journey when the city on whose streets he lived, homeless, was more than 30 miles away, or why he'd stolen this particular car from a salvage yard garage there, or why it had even started after so many years of neglect. It all just happened. The car from my closet had waited three decades to come out. And come out it finally did. I am on a boat now. I have seen something out on the water to my left that has made me very afraid. Even as people enjoy themselves at the bar, hold the hands of dates, take selfies on the upper deck, upload those photos to social media. There is someone approaching the cruise boat in a very, very tiny boat, not much more than a skiff, really. Some little thing puttering across the calm surface of the bay towards us. I can see a figure sitting in the back of the skiff, operating the motor, while another figure stands, watching the cruise boat as they come closer. And I know in my gut that something is about to happen to us, as inexplicable as what happened to the people on that plane in 2013, to that actress getting off the train in 1990, and to my father two years ago. This time, I am sure, I will be a victim. I and everyone on board this craft. The sun has gone behind a cloud and the skiff is coming ever closer, taking its time. What harm could it and the two figures on board possibly cause us, a detached observer might think. But as I have said, I have this feeling. I have witnessed bizarre and legendary fates having to do with all manners of transit, you see. So I've developed this sense. This won't be a simple act of terrorism or piracy. The little boat that draws near is bringing something which will confound reporters and investigators forever. Something to bend the imagination in permanent terrible ways. I'm getting up from my seat now to go up on the deck. I want to meet whatever's coming in the fresh air. Let it be said that even after all I witnessed, I never was afraid to embrace travel, to tilt my face to the sky and revel in riding through ever-expanding space on the wondrous machinery of humankind.